Welcome to SBCA's Lumber Connection Podcast, where we discuss today's market and explore tomorrow's trends. Here's our host, Molly Butts. Well, hello, and welcome to a very special edition of Lumber Connection. I am wrapping up the end of our 2021 podcast season with a very, very special guest, our very own Director of Communications, Sean Shields. Welcome, Sean. Hey, Molly. It's uh, it's really good to be here. It's really weird for you to be here, too, isn't it? It, it is. It is really weird. But I uh, <laughs> love the idea of being a guest on your podcast. I love the idea of you being a guest on my podcast, but there's a very specific reason, too. Mm -hmm. There's a very specific reason. Last week, if you recall, and I'm imagining you do, one really interesting topic came up, and that was the um, <clears throat> new, slightly higher <laughs> uh, Canadian <laughs> softwood lumber tariffs. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, you're an expert. Well, <laughs> I guess by default, yes. Uh, this is an interesting topic for me personally, because uh, when I was brought on uh, in early 2004 to work with SPCA, um, I was asked to basically be involved in their lobbying efforts and to try to get uh, component manufacturers and their supply chain more engaged with their lawmakers. And at that time, uh, the softwood lumber dispute between the U.S. and Canada was probably the premier issue um, facing the industry as it pertains to sort of talking to lawmakers. Um, there's a lot of consternation in the market and sort of what we're seeing now with uh, these large tariffs and duties and um, a lot of wringing of hands of like what the, you know, what that will do to the price of lumber and all that kind of thing uh, was on the forefront of many people's minds. And so I've, I've sort of been involved in this topic ever since then. Like forever. I think it might be one of the only things I heard you talk about for the first several years of your career with SBCA. <laughs> yeah, it was probably the only, well, I probably thought it was the only interesting thing to talk about, but it, <laughs> yeah. I probably should have paid attention when other people's, whole bunch of yeah, when other people's <laughs> eyes were glazing over, I should have probably paid attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, as we chat today, Sean, I may have to interrupt you for some clarifications because, I mean, I just, I don't have the awareness that you do, but that's why I'm so thankful to have you here today to to share a little bit more about what's happening. And, you know, I mean, it's it's pretty clear that the lumber market is sort of trending upward. And so I, I imagine this has something to do with it, mm -hmm. but I, I expect that you'll be able to to share all of the, the nitty gritty details with us. Oh, yeah. um, let, let's jump right in. Sure. We've been on a roller coaster, an absolute lumber roller coaster. And, um, you know, right now the Biden administration is taking a lot of heat with the U.S. Department of Commerce announcing this new, what are we at, 17.99%, I think, this this new duty mm -hmm. on softwood lumber imported from Canada. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what might have led to this decision? Sure. A whole lot, actually. And <laughs> I'll be careful not to get too much into the weeds. So I, I think the, the fundamental thing uh, for everybody just to have in the back of their minds when they're thinking about this and seeing it occur, because I think the, the initial response is like, this is just a kick in the teeth, right? Like the lumber market's going crazy. It's all over the place. It keeps on going higher. And then the U.S. government comes in and like tax on almost 20 percent on the cost. Like that's ridiculous. What in the world is going on? So I, I think the first thing to, to sort of just, again, think about is that uh, this all stems from the fact that the U.S. and Canada are fundamentally different in how they approach softwood lumber manufacturing. So in the U.S., all of our merchantable timber lens are largely held by private entities. You know, you, me, uh, real estate investment trusts, those kind of things, REITs, um, th their private dollars are um, being spent on owning those lands, growing those trees, and uh, eventually harvesting those trees for profit, hopefully a profit. But in Canada, all the timberlands are owned by the crown, by the government. Hmm. And so while in the US, market forces like supply and demand and even perception to a certain extent affect the value of logs and of sticks. But in Canada, the provincial government set what's called a stumpage rate, and that determines the amount of trees that can be harvested in a given year and how much lumber manufacturers must pay for those trees. 
or at least the right to harvest those trees. Oh, yeah. And so it, it's entirely different. You have market forces versus sort of a government imposed rate. Now, the Canadians would argue that they're setting that rate based on the market, but still they can make unilateral decisions to help the lumber industry out if they feel like they need to. Um, and that's that's commonly been one of the accusations. So that fundamental difference of you know, how logs are priced and um, how they get to uh, the mills to be processed uh, led the U.S. producers first to file action against Canada in 1982. And that's where this trade dispute really started. And we've been through five iterations of it. Uh, The last one started here in 2015 when the previous negotiated settlement uh, that was set in 2006 expired. And that's where I started becoming a geek on this is because we are in the midst of like the hairy nitty gritty of like, what are we going to do and how are we going to fix it and all that stuff from like 2004 to 2006. After it expired in 2015, there was a one year moratorium where neither country could really do anything. And that moratorium was purposely set up to get the two countries back to the negotiating table to come up with a new agreement. Obviously, nothing happened. Both, uh, you know, our U.S. trade representative and Canada's U.S. trade representative met every month, all 12 of those months. They threw a bunch of proposals back and forth. Um, There were a lot of interesting uh, and creative proposals thrown out there, but ultimately nothing emerged. And so as soon as that one year moratorium expired, the gloves came off. You know, I think part of the problem here may have stemmed from the timing, because when that moratorium was expiring. NAFTA was also expiring. And so, you know, there was a desire, mostly on the behalf of the Trump administration, to use the software lumber dispute as leverage with Canada as they established that new free trade agreement. It ultimately didn't really work that way. But um, I mean, I think that was sort of the goal. And then by the time we were through that, we were just sort of in this messy place that we are in. Um, The Department of Commerce has been left to have to sort of work uh, through U.S. trade law. And U.S. trade law, you know, the way it's written and the way the the Department of Commerce is required to sort of establish harm uh, against U.S. producers, it's going to find um, that harm is done. It's just because of its narrow scope. And so that's sort of where we find ourselves is that the Department of Commerce really doesn't have an option here. When it is looking at the numbers that it is required to look at, it's going to find a disparity. And that's mostly because the U.S. trade law doesn't recognize differences in how these things work. You know, again, getting back to stumpage rate versus market forces. So that's kind of why the Department of Commerce is coming out with this number. You know, it's set a timeline. It has to adhere to that timeline. That timeline was set irrespective of what was going on with the market. And um, so that's why we find ourselves in the situation right this moment. Okay, so and maybe you're planning to cover this later, but um, I am curious. I I remember in reading about this sort of going into a couple of weeks ago in a podcast that, you know, right as it was happening, originally the amount was supposed to be higher, but then some additional research and work was done sort of over the summer. And instead, the the price is a little, the the overall duty is actually a little lower than was originally forecast. Do you have a sense for what changed? I mean, it's not significantly lower, but it is a little lower. Yeah, I mean, not a great deal. I mean, I think the the big thing there is uh, typically you're looking at the quantity of lumber shipped across the border. And obviously, you're also looking at, at the cost. You know, with the market doing what it did, um, you know, that has a small impact. But again, the the Department of Commerce isn't really looking at, uh, by and large, you know, what's what's going on with lumber in the market right now. You know, it has to look at sort of this historical perspective for the most part. And so I think it's good news that the announced rate is lower than the estimated rate that they had, but it's still very close. You know, it's not like they came out with 11% versus <laughs> no. 18%. You know, they they came in right about where where they said they were, it was going to be. Well, and that's about double where it was, right? We were like 8.99. So this was a huge hike. Mm-hmm. You know, I know, I know it's been a little frustrating because we, we were so high. Lumber prices were so high. And then they just, they fell and fell and fell. And it felt good 
in that sort of valley. But here we are trending up, up, up in the second half of 2021. And this this announcement just seems to be exacerbating that trend. Why? Mm-hmm. Why is that? Well, you know, I think I think the big part is it's a market, right? And it's a commodity market on top of all. It's really yeah. supposed to be driven by supply and demand, you know? And so, you know, as your uh, other two illustrious guests on this podcast <laughs> always point out, it's all about whether or not the buyers need the supply or there is an oversupply. That's that's having the biggest impact. And then to a lesser extent, sometimes, uh, you know, transportation issues or something uh, may be exacerbating stuff getting to market or whatnot. And that might change uh, how much somebody is willing to pay to get something or the availability of a particular product. But again, it's always supply and demand that's largely driving all of this. When you have this like sporadic government intervention, our markets aren't well equipped for that. And so when the Department of Commerce comes and makes an announcement that they're going to uh, suddenly add a tariff onto uh, Canadian imported lumber, which you know constitutes about 30 to 35 percent of the lumber we consume in the U.S., so it's not an insignificant portion, you know, there's there's an emotional reaction to that then, right? There's there's this question in people's minds as far as uh, okay so wow that that duty is going to be imposed what are the Canadian importers or exporters going to do right are mm-hmm. they going to continue selling the same amount to the U S or are they going to start finding other markets I mean we've seen that happen with Canadians in the past particularly in British Columbia you know the BC uh, producers would ship a bunch of logs off to China. And so there would be a lot of fiber that would suddenly disappear out of the North American market. There's fear over that. Um, There's some concerns as far as like, okay, so that's going to raise the cost of Canadian SPF. What's that going to do to Southern pine prices? Like how quickly is that going to come up? Are any of the Canadian mills going to curtail production because suddenly, you know, they don't want to export as much lumber to the U.S.? Are they going to keep some of that more of that lumber in Canada? There aren't really clear answers to any one of those questions, typically. Those are just all the types of questions that suddenly get thrown out there because the government has done something. Well, can I ask one question in there, though? And, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things you said is that they suddenly, except for we, we know that it wasn't sudden. We knew that this tariff was coming. And so mm-hmm. it makes me want to ask the question, the sort of gradual increase we've been seeing over the last couple of months. Do you feel like that was potentially the beginning of the reaction to what was, I mean, we knew this was coming, right? So then like, I don't know, I'm seeing some folks sitting around going, okay, we know that in a couple of months, we're going to have to be, you know, this extra 18% is coming. Let's start ramping up pricing now so that once we get there, it feels okay for every, well, it doesn't feel okay for us, but (laughs) it feels okay for them. You know, like, were they sort of pre-planning? Right. Well, that's a very good point. So if you go back to when the Department of Commerce announced that it was going to be 18%, that's where you really saw the volatility happen. The The yeah. market reacted then. And as it settled out, it settled out with that sort of 18% expected okay. in there. So, I mean, they use this term, it's baked into the price. That's mm. that's exactly sort of what ends up happening is that okay. there, was, there was basically this market anticipation that that 18% would have to be paid. Uh, at some point, whenever, well, and I guess they knew when the Department of Commerce was going to make that announcement. So yes, I mean, there's the anticipation of that. Now, you know, there's probably a little volatility after the DOC announces it just because some people in the market were expecting that them to come higher than 18% and some expected it to be lower than 18%. So then there's that sort of figuring out the comparing the expectation to the reality. Nonetheless, frustrating, probably. Um, I love I love my experts that come with me every week and, you know, they're trying to read their magic eight balls. We joke about that a lot. I'm sure we'd all love to have a crystal ball, but I'm I guess I'm curious, you know, what like, is there anything we can do? What does the future look like? Like, are these coming back down? Are they going to go up <laughs> higher? What, you know, what does what does this look like going forward um, into the next few sure. years? Well, let me let me pull up my crystal ball here. Um, <laughs> Wait a minute, nope. where have you been hiding that? <laughs> yep. No, it's it's still completely cloudy, so okay. uh, I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to put it away. All right. So, I mean, the easy answer to your question is there is no end in sight to this current dispute. Mm. You know, I I think everyone, including <laughs> members of the U.S. government, sort of look at these trade actions and they say, you know, it's really not balanced. Like the tariffs are not 
they're either too high or they're not needed at all kind of thing. Sure. And largely, you know, all the other large trade organizations like WTO and, you know, NAFTA before, what is it, the USMCA, uh, sort of always sided with Canada. Uh, most recently, the WTO sided with, with Canada again, and the U.S. appealed that decision. But the funny part is, is the Trump administration blocked any appointments to the appellate process within the WTO. So there's there's actually nobody physically to appeal the ruling to. Mm, that makes it uh, so difficult, it's just, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So it's just sort of sitting in mm. limbo right now. Mm. You know, I, I think it's important to just sort of keep in mind that, again, as we just talked about, the, the 18% is kind of baked into uh, the overall price, although it's important to sort of keep in mind that different lumber companies are assessed tariffs at different rates. So like Resolute right. pays the largest duty at almost 30%. Can four is at like nineteen and a half. Oh, you wow. got inner four at seventeen point nine. Okay, but then on the low end, you got like West Fraser that's only paying eleven hmm. percent. The hard part here, though, is that there needs to be a motivation to eventually get back to the negotiating table. That's really the only way that this ever gets fixed. Is yeah. that the two countries need to come to a negotiated agreement as far as how this is going to be handled? Is that going to happen? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, it probably will eventually. But the hard part okay. is that like, you know, when I got involved in this the last time around, mm -hmm. there was a huge motivation on, on the side of the Canadian government to get a negotiated agreement. So they were willing to sort of take a bad deal because a deal was better than no deal. Sure. Uh, yeah. The US really took advantage of that uh, in many ways. Uh, but you know, one of the big things that came out of that negotiated agreement the last time was the fact that like almost six billion dollars were collected in these duties and they're 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 considered wow. on deposit. So that six billion dollars didn't go to the U.S. government. It didn't go to U.S. producers. It just went into a bank account for many years. And so part of the negotiated oh. summit, it was like five point two billion of that went back to U.S. I mean, it went back to Canadian companies. Like they just got the, a huge cash infusion and the wow. other like 0.8 went to uh, create sort of, you know, softwood lumber marketing. It created the softwood lumber board, which funds okay. things like woodworks and, you know, mm -hmm. wood is good and all those kinds of, you know, all, all that like, uh, you know, mass timber stuff that's going on right now. Most of that is being driven by the money by the, that was originally, okay. you know, came out of the last negotiated settlement. So that <laughs> 5.2 billion goes back to Canadian companies and it happens at a time when, um, you know, the beetle kill in Canada is, uh, you know, being able to harvest all that timber is coming to a close. And, and the B.C. provincial government is announcing, hey, just so you know, for the next that, that, that's it for the next 60 years, we're we're not really cutting much because we had to let yeah. all, all those trees grow. Right. I mean, that would never fly here in the U.S., but again, because of the two different systems, but because the crown owns all the land, they're basically like, nope, can't cut any trees. Yeah. <laughs> yep, we're and, done. <laughs> and so you have, you know, these major lumber mills in British Columbia, like Canfor, Interfor, and West Fraser, who are like, huh, well, our our revenue stream is about to disappear. And, th and they know it's coming, right? It's, it's, a, it's a long process to get through cutting down all those trees, and you know that you're going to have to pay the piper at some point. So that clock is ticking. Uh, they're also looking at the fiber basket in the south, which again, it's trees. It was planted, you know, 30 years yeah. ago. They know it's coming to a point where all that, that timber needs to get cut down. So there's going to be a, a huge resource uh, there in the south. So what do they do with that $5.2 billion that they get in that windfall? They go and buy a bunch of U.S. South companies. Wait, wait a minute. We imposed a tariff, then we gave the money back in the settlement, and now the Canadian companies are buying Southern mills? Yeah, they just basically bought most of the Southern pine production. And not only did so they buy the companies, but then they built them. them buying. <laughs> yes. Yep. That's oh exactly what happened. <laughs> okay. Hmm. So I, that's kind of where we find ourselves in a new situation this time around, because the Canadian companies are holding most of the cards on both sides of the negotiating table. Wow. And so their motivation to come to a negotiated settlement is different uh, yeah. than it was the last time around. They are not desperate. They certainly want to get to a negotiated settlement. I mean, anytime you have protectionist trade action, it's just, it's not good. 
you know, it harms their industries, particularly on the Canadian side of the border. Um, they'd also like to get a lot of that money back, right? Get another big cash yeah. infusion. God knows what they're going to do with it when they finally get it. Uh, I have no idea how much money it is. I don't think it's $6 billion or anywhere close to that at this point, but it's um, still a significant amount of money. Probably some money sitting there. Yeah. Right. So there's all that. And, but at this point, the Canadian government is not desperate and the U.S. is not motivated either. So we're just kind of sitting here waiting to see who, um, I guess it's a game of chicken, right? Who's, who's going to give in first? Well, Sean, this is all very interesting, but I suppose the, the real question I have sort of burning on my mind, and I, I imagine our listeners do too, is if this is just going to continue, there's no real motivation on either side of the fence, so to speak, to sit down and negotiate. And we're not really even sure what that negotiation would look like. And based on previous experiences, it might take a year or more. What do I do now? What do I do right now as a lumber purchaser? Because mm -hmm. I need to have answers for the, you know, first three, four or five, you know, months of the year. And, and I'm not sure what to do. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a really great question. And, and just one point of clarification, too, is that there's a lot of pressure by U.S. lumber purchasers to find a solution that will bring the price of lumber down, right? So you have the yeah. home builders out there, you got the LBMs of the world and whatnot, who are all saying, hey, U.S. government do something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and the reality is, it's like, yep, that's, you know, you, you mentioned a year in your question. Uh, that's probably a short time frame. I, I think sure. that would be best case scenario is if, if there's some sort of motivation to get back to a negotiated agreement within the next year. I think we're going to be here for a while. It something might unlikely. have to fundamentally <laughs> shift. Yeah. I don't know what that is, but something will have to. But as long as we continue without this permanent agreement in place, even if they do reach a negotiated settlement, if it's not permanent, we're going to we're going to end up back here again at some point. So, you know, I think really biggest problem are sort of the supply chain challenges, you know, whether it's labor shortages, transportation network disruptions, you know, those kinds of things are probably the primary drivers of a volatile market. Uh, but things like this, uh, these duties, uh, also introduce volatility. And so we should take them uh, sort of with the same level of seriousness. Um, you know, for lumber purchasers, I think their their best practice is to sort of address their risk is, or their risk exposure in the mm -hmm. terms of their customer contracts. Um, oh, you know, sure. if they're signing yeah. a contract that sets terms for anything outside of like a short term window, like a really short term window, yeah, you know, they need to make sure they have the ability to go back and revise those terms if the market goes on a wild roller coaster like it has over the last couple of years. You know, I think SBCA's legal counsel, uh, Ken Pagel, you know, he's hosted a number of webinars and education sessions focused on this topic over the last few years. Um, so I'd encourage everybody listening, if you're you're interested in getting some some ideas on, OK, what provision should I look at? Um, what should I uh, suggest as a change to those provisions to go back and listen to some of his uh uh, podcast or his webinars. Uh, they're on our website, sbcacomponents.com. You know, I think that this is also a topic Kent's probably going to address some more in early 2022, uh, given everything that's going like, on. Yeah, I think it sounds like a very good topic for him to circle back to, shall we right. say. Right. You know, and I say that one other thing, too, is I know, uh, you know, again, your great guests point to this a lot, but I've had a lot of story or I've heard a lot of stories from component manufacturers over the last six months that leads me to believe that a lot of CMs have changed their purchasing behavior um, in 2021, essentially retaining smaller inventories. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Now would probably be a good time to sort of look at how that strategy is working for their company. And uh, also to make sure like it, that your contract terms reflect that change in your buying behavior, you know, because some of them may have done one without doing the other, but you should really make sure that those two things are aligned. Well, that sounds like some pretty solid advice. I think we're certainly, certainly the conversations on our regular uh, everyday scheduled podcast have been towards a little bit more of a just in time inventory, as you've uh, suggested. So I do think it's time to reevaluate. And, you know, I, 
I'm getting the impression from both you and, you know, sort of everything that we're hearing regularly and from our other experts that some of these prices may not may be here to stay for a little while. And so just sort of taking that into consideration as you're, you know, working through the next projects is, is going to be the best thing that you can do. Right. Yeah. I mean, the worst thing you can do is keep your head down, right? Yeah. You, you got to you got to be reading everything, looking at everything, hopefully listening to this podcast and it's, it's spurring you to go read a whole bunch more. And Yes, absolutely. Well, Sean, I really appreciate this. I think, you know, this is probably one of a handful of topics that we could expand a little bit more on. I mean, our, my, you know, my regular guys, uh, Ken and JB, give us sort of a market update each week. Uh, but as, as you're thinking and listening to this podcast, if there's some other things that are on your mind or that you think, you know, you'd like to have a little more information about, let us know. Sean obviously has a huge history. Uh, not just with Softwood Lumber, but obviously with SVCA and with our industry in general. And I think, you know, he could lend a hand on a few other things or if there's some other folks that could come in and, and do a special edition with us, that would be great, too. So I encourage you to give us your suggestions, ask your questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. I appreciate you being with me today, Sean. Thank you so much for all of your expertise. Uh, I hope that our listeners have had a good time learning a little bit more. I sure did. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure, Molly. Thanks for uh, inviting me on. It's been fun. Absolutely. Thank you and have a great holiday season and happy new year. This has been a Lumber Connection podcast by SBCA. If you have a question you'd like a guest to answer on a future podcast, send it to podcast at sbcacomponents.com.